Uh, yes, I, I'm, um, uh, I'm at Cambridge. I'm a visiting scientist there, and I'm participating in the in, in the IONS program. And I'm, yeah, I'm um, with mainly computer engineers and computer scientists. So I'm a little bit of a shadow water. My my background is is human science, human sciences, and I specialize at taking the um, looking at the human dimension and incorporating that in future technologies. So I've been doing that for decades. Um, how many of you are interested in your backgrounds? Here, how many of you are computer science people? I'm not. Okay, well, well, that's good news. Not all of you are. I was giving a talk at University of um, Oslo a, a few months ago and couldn't get anyone to answer any questions. And there were just these blanks. And afterwards, I, I asked uh, my sponsor, what went wrong? And he said, well, you were talking about things they didn't understand anything about. And they didn't want to ask questions. Oh, am I not being, is this microphone? But it's only for the camera, it doesn't. Oh, OK. And unfortunately, the air conditioning. By the way, Carmen just flew in yesterday. No, no, no. Andrea just flew in yesterday. <laughs> but you flew in? I, I flew in, yeah, a few days ago. Yeah. From, from, from Guatemala. From Guatemala. No, I, I'm, I'm not Guatemalan. I know I look it. My name is, is very Latin, but no. I've lived in England most of my life. But um, some time ago, I decided to get out of the rat race, and I live in Guatemala now. Um, beautiful land of eternal spring. But I come back and forth back and forth. And un unlike Andrea, I, I, I couldn't stand up the morning, the next, the morning after. So, okay, so we've got quite a few computer scientists, and I know you said you were a sociologist. And sociologist? How many sociologists? Oh, quite a few. One, two, three, four. Any psychologists? Oh, you're cognitive psych. Okay. Yeah. Because probably a lot of what I'll talk about, well, you'll see, is very different from psychology, traditional psychology. OK, so um, or is there any, anything, anybody else from another discipline that we haven't? Well, law, of course. How many lawyers? Yeah, oh, we have philosophy. Oh, philosophy? OK, excellent. Oh, good. Good. Yeah, because this talk is, um, this is very, very psychologically oriented. So I'm going to start by. Um, and, and it's, it's an overall view. I mean, you know, with this amount of time, it can't go into great detail on, on anything. But it's really meant to present some different frameworks for thinking about things and raising questions and uh, giving review of some different dimensions. So yes, we talk about the dimensions of identity, trust, and privacy as social, cultural, psychological phenomena. So I'm going to start by looking at the, can you hear me now? I'm going to start. We're going to start by looking at the core elements of the human psychic. And the reason I'm doing this is because in order to understand behaviors and changing behaviors, which is, of course, what we're really interested in right now um, you know, with, the, with social media and the internet and, and digital domains, it's important to understand, it's easier to understand these behaviors and behavioral changes if we can understand how the human psychic is constructed. And I'm going to be looking at this within the um, within the context of identity, privacy, and trust. And then we're going to move on, and this is going to be a very broad overview of how these are changing within digital experiences and digital domains. And at the end, I'm going to pull it together into a cognitive architecture so we can see how it all fits together or doesn't fit together. So the focus really is going to be identity. Because identity, and identity is the backdrop for privacy and trust and pretty much every oops and pretty much everything else. I said that it was going to be um, I'm not a psychologist, I'm a human scientist. Um, I also got a background in uh, which you'll probably recognize in here in uh, psychoanalysis. So I adopt a very different perspective of, of looking at people and their behaviors. So the perspective that I'm adopting is a psychognitive perspective, which is different from the psychological one because it takes a holistic, social, cultural, um, systemic view of human behaviors and the underlying and the subconscious processes that, uh, that underlie these behaviors. So it's very different from the psychology that you you know, and, and some of it won't be. So we're going to start with the formation of identity. Now, 
intrinsic to the human condition is the way in which human beings organize all of their experiences, both internal and external. And these are organized around three dimensions. Uh, well, first of all, I should say, before the, the dimensions, the, the underlying core question that we all have, it's cultural independent, it's contextually independent. The underlying the question is, who am I and who I am? Two different sides of the question, same question. And the, 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 this question is informed within these three dimensions. So one is presence. Where am I? Where am I? Um, where am belonging? Where do I belong? And the other is relationship. How do I stand in relation to these many realms? Okay, before the realms were, were, were contained and, and um, defined, you know, there was family and there was work and there was church and there was community, right? Okay, this is all, of course, changing, which we'll look at. Um, and the other one, oh, and the part of the relationship is not how do I relate, where, where do I, uh, oops, how do I, where do I belong in these many, uh, am I related, but is, is, am I connected? Which is all, which is was the other part of relationship, and the last one is contribution, and that is, what is my contribution? Um, do, do I, will I, can I, make a contribution, in these different realms, and will I have mattered at the end? So identity is is thus best construed as both relational and contextual. Okay, so this is kind of like the, the first level of how identity is formed. And do stop me if you, if you have any questions as, as we go along, okay? Or there'll be time afterwards. So there are two important dimensions which characterize um, identity. One is the dynamic feedback loop by which identity is constructed. So it starts with the question, who am I? And then this external process kicks off. Okay? In order to, to answer that question, the, the self, the person, goes off into these different um, realms to explore. So I'm not used to this, so I'll put it down. <laughs> to, to, to explore um, and gather, gather data about who they are. Right? And so this data collection goes into building up the content of identity. It adds, subtracts, this is who I am, this is not who I am. It's this constant um, content building, content creation of, of, of identity. And then that goes into, oh, who I am, who I am. And then it goes into this internal process where all this is, is processed, and it comes up again with the same question, who am I? And it goes through the whole loop. So as human beings, we're continuously, continuously going through this loop all the time where it's a continuous search for identity, who I am. Um, and the, now although this is, this first part of what I'm talking about is completely independent of, of internet stuff, but I want you to keep in the back of your mind how this relates to the way, you, how, how this is manifested in the, in digital domains right now. The, the second dimension is the, is the time con, uh, continuum. Identity, is, identity creation formation is accumulative over time. So who I am today is a sum of who I was in the past, of every, everything I've done in the past. And that's why the focus of identity is very much on the future. Yeah? Most people are not happy to be who I am today. Okay? So, yeah, and then we'll, we'll see why in a moment, why the future is so important to the formation of identity. The human psychic is organized around two points, uh, desire and fear. It's part of our psychological anatomy. The, the dynamic that this creates lies at the center of identity formation and construction. So desire is all about adding, adding 
if we're looking, adding who we are, adding more, adding more, and creating more, creating more to, to our identity and our concept of who we are, or who we believe we are. And at the other point, there's fear. There's fear, fear about being around being deficient in some way, not having enough, not being enough, um, or loss, losing identity. It's one of the, the, the key fears that, that, that one has. Now, these two points, both of these two points, desire and fear, can be internally and externally triggered, meaning that it's not dependent on external conditions or, or experiences to have the fear um, triggered or, or to have the desire triggered. It can be an entirely internal process that occurs independent of anything external. So th this, I, this tension becomes, is evident in, an, in another, in another um, uh, dilemma that surrounds identity. Once identity is formed, you know, once we go into that loop where, ah, this is who I am, there's the internal urge to share that, to reveal, to share that, that identity with others. So the dilemma really, the dilemma, uh, the tension being around desire and fear, the desire is to, is to reveal, and the, question, the dilemma is how much do I reveal and how much do I not reveal? Do I or do I not reveal anything about who I am? And the desire comes from the, the need to, uh, for relationship, the need for, for, for connection. Because you know, friendships are, are based on the mutual knowledge of each other's, uh, of each other's lives. And in an unmediated um, society, social currency is built on this mutual knowledge of, um, of, of each other. But the fears that um, are around the use, the, around use and abuse and exposure and, 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 and vulnerability. So the, the, this dynamic tension underlies the, um, the dilemma of, um, of um, the, the root of privacy. So when it, when it comes to privacy, this is really at the root, this vulnerability, this fear around it, about being exposed, and the desire to, to share. Um, on your reading list, I put, um, I don't know if any of you looked at it, but I put um, uh, Islands of Privacy, Christina Nippert Ng's book. Do, do you know that, her book? Um, she claims that everybody on a daily basis uh, repeatedly has to resolve this, this problem and that it's embedded in every relationship, the need, and it's in, in every relationship, the need to connect and the need to disconnect as well. She claims that it is at the root of the quest for, for privacy. Have, they, have any of you read her book? That's an amazing book. Yeah, it's very good. Oh, slipped. Okay. Hmm? If you just go like this to the screen, you'll go to the next slide too. Okay. Not the screen. Not if you touch the screen. Okay. Okay. Just swipe it. Okay. So privacy is a complex construct with with underlying social, cultural, and and psychological factors, which is why it encompasses a range of meanings. And it has been described as an elastic concept. And particularly in in, in um, digital domain, in the digital domain, privacy is a is a very confusing and undefined um, um, uh, concept. So, but although despite the variability in conceptual and everyday definitions, um, the the meanings tend to emphasize a limited view, uh, a limited access view of, of privacy. Um, and if we look at these different contours of privacy. Um, we can see that it's the the use the the use of um, the release and use of personal information is central to each one. Now I'd be curious because when I was trying to break out the the different contours of privacy, these are the ones I came up with, and I'm curious whether there's any that you think are missing there. I mean, those of you who. 
Do you mean the, the top level or the, the, the top level, yeah. I mean, there's always like, things missing on the, on the bottom level. But so I broke it through into these, these different, uh, the, these six different, different categories. But there's probably others as well. No, I didn't do anything. I was just standing. <laughs> well, that's strange. Oops. <laughs> no. Can you do it better? Can you do it better? Aren't you? I could only okay. I didn't. I didn't do anything. I was just standing. I, I even worse luck, so. <laughs> well, what's interesting? I'm just going to pull out what what, what I find um, uh, most interesting here. I mean, a lot of it is interesting, but what's what's very interesting here is the behavioral science support for the importance of of, of privacy. And there's been a number of studies, um, social um, and behavioral science studies uh, around this area. But perhaps the strongest and the most controversial is Altman's who concluded um, from his review across cultural data that, that privacy is a cultural universal. And another conclusion of his was that privacy could be universal in non-literate societies. So it wasn't just a, um, it, w it wasn't just a Western value. Um, there was, an, by the side, I just found this, this was interesting when I was doing this research, another conclusion from another study, co completely different, was that, that privacy was also universal in non-human species. Yeah? Oh, you've come across that. Swistons? Yeah. Animals? Yes. Yeah, I, I found that, that, that in, that's interesting. And, and in studies of, of cross-cultural social rules, uh, two of the most widely applicable uh, rules across cultures regarding relationship was the respect for, um, for another's privacy. And, and the, the other one was um, uh, not, not, not revealing what one was told in confidence. And there was a third one, too, by the side, which is a sociologist I can say because you won't find it boring, and that you look at another person in the eye when you speak to them. So those were the three universal social rules. That certainly wouldn't work here, huh? I wonder if they studied England. If nobody looks anybody in the eye here. <laughs> so, in in the um, in in the last. <laughs> <laughs> I just tried to look Chris in the eye, and he was looking down. <laughs> <laughs> just try that. Try looking people in the eye when they they talk. It's, it's not you're not used to it. So, in the in the last two contours um, that I've outlined here. The, the retreat and the confessional. The confessional, although I said I don't want to go off into anything internet related at the moment, um, the confessional is, is interesting because that's very much about clearing the, um, clearing the deck and having a clean slate with which to move forward. And here we, we see the, um, you know, we can see the role of, of priest, therapist, right, come in. You know, and, or we've all had experiences or heard of experiences of, of um, revealing all to a complete stranger or a complete stranger revealing all, you know, in an airport or on a bus, right, or on a train, you know, where they reveal things that they've never told anybody before and you've revealed things that you would never tell anybody before. Um, and I pulled this out because I think to a certain extent, I mean, this is what we're, we're, we're seeing on the Internet, you know. We, we, so, and, and then retreat is all about the escape and the uh, re regrouping, which Altman and Weston suggest supports um, essential psychological uh, functioning. I'm going to try this. Oh, okay. So, therefore, um, privacy serves a number of uh, core psychological functions like personal autonomy. Um, protection, hide and escape, um, and, and identity preservation. And as, as humans, we've developed a range of behaviors and sophisticated strategies around, around revealing and regulating um, information um, about, about ourselves. So Kaufman, what did you say? Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot to say it here, that, that uh, Schneier is, um, are, are any of you familiar with his work, Schneier? The, the privacy? Yeah, yeah. Uh, probably pronouncing it wrong. As well as others um, have claimed that the need for, um, for privacy is inherent in, in human nature. 
And this is important to keep in, in mind when we later um, look at what's happening uh, around the areas around privacy and, and trust um, on the internet um, and, and what, what's happening to this, this core um, this core value uh, and this core part of our human nature. So, we had Kaufman, a, uh, the, the, the social psychologist that Andrea mentioned earlier, or not mentioned but talked about earlier, he had a theory that individual, that every individual is an actor on, on a stage and is, um, and is performing for an audience and that the front stage is where the individual's giving their performance and the backstage is where the vulnerable self resides. Um, and he had a theory that, um, the, uh, that individuals st uh, build a strong barrier between the front stage and the backstage, partly to, pre um, to protect the vulnerable self in the backstage, but also to preserve the authenticity of, you know, it ha seems to happen when I just move, the authenticity of the front stage performance. And uh, Christina uh, Nipper um, Ng, she talks about in her book, The Islands of uh, Privacy, about the strategies and the principles and the practices we use to create and maintain and modify what she refers to as cultural categories, these categorical um, boundaries which contain pockets of inaccessibility and accessibility of information with which to create this public private boundary that Andrea was, was mentioning and that's um, that that's really uh, has a lot of um, it's a whole area now for for discussion how do we build these but where, where do we set these boundaries and her whole book is about that how do we set these boundaries where do they begin where did they end uh, before we knew where they started where they began pretty much and now it's all open <clears throat> so the phenomenon of trust, okay, we're moving on to trust now. The phenomenon of trust is characterized by subjectivity and expectations. So, so Lumen um, described it as objective, uh, objective uncertainty transformed into subjective certainty. Right? Which, which basically means trust is purely subjective. It's, it's an internal subjective process, right? that there's no objective basis for trusting. Um, and subjective trust comes from this internal um, expectation that an individual um, or others will respond, behave, and act in a certain way. So that there'll be a certain level of cooperation. And so we, we trust that. So trust... I'm not even touching it. No, I'm not even moving. Oh, okay. Sorry, I was just trying to figure out. Yeah, 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 it was, I, me too. Since I'm, I've already interrupted, I'm sorry. <laughs> 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 it's just a ruse. I know, sorry about um, this is this is This is really relevant to quite a few of the groups are, are talking about how trust doesn't just have one definition and how, how um, when, we're, when we're discussing it, we're, we're coming up with long lists, like 10, 15 different ways to approach trust. And so this idea of objective uncertainty transformed into subjective certainty um, is really interesting because we're talking specifically, right, about how the mind is processing trust. Is, is that what we're talking about? Or are we talking about it more in terms of um, how, I, how I form my identity in relation to understanding trust? No, I think it's the latter. I think what we're talking, we're, what we're talking here about the psychological, um, that's, that trust is a, a purely psychological construct, okay. right? And I think the, the next slide, we talk a little bit more uh, about it. But um, yeah, it's, it's purely, so I'm interested, how can you come up with a whole long list of trust? Define trust from, from oh, okay. like a legal perspective, from a technical perspective, right. social, psychological, um, right. and, yeah. and then how, how we, all the different contexts in which we're enacting trust. Oh, right, okay. So, oh, that, that's interesting. That's interesting. No, this is purely, um, yeah, it's, it's purely psychological. Okay. 
yeah, so as a psychological construct, there's no subjective um, basis for, I mean, there's no objective basis for trust. Although, um, although the next line, might as well go on to the next one, is, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it there. So, um, what's this there? So, um, yeah, vulnerability lies lies at the um, at the root of trust, which is why it's so mysteriously complex, right? Yeah, because it's uh, it's in, and but the function of trust, no matter what context you're in, is to overcome risk and uncertainty. Mm-hmm. There's many who claim that that trust is part of our biological programming. You know, it's it's innate in us. Okay, it's not. We're, we're born trusting. Yeah? You know how trusting little children are. We're born trusting. Okay, that, that's sort of, I think that's kind of uh, uh, commonly um, accepted. And, and therefore, um, like Lumen and, and others will say that, that trust is, uh, as a species, trust um, is our default. Yeah? Our default is to trust. And there, Schneier and, and many others have written about it, says because the reason that we, we trust or it's, it's in, ingrained in us, is because it's a way of cutting through all of the complexity. Yeah? It, it, it's a shortcut. If, if we didn't have the shortcut, if we weren't wired up to trust, can you imagine how we would get through every single day if we had to keep going through the, the analytical process of do I trust, do I not trust, is this safe, is this not safe, how many risks are here, right? Yeah, so it's, it's a shortcut. The, the, as already uh, touched on, the, the dynamic of um, desire and fear um, permeates trust. Okay, because you know we, we, we desire to trust, we're scared to trust, desire to trust, and and this process that we go through is become so subconscious and, and low level that unless something uh, externally is flagging that this, that desire to trust, we just go through life need for uh, relationship, this inherent need to connect, that pushes through the fear. So it's the desire to connect that will push us to, to trust. The, um, this is uh, the other point that you might find, find interesting, the, the, um, the ability to trust, okay, although I, I've said that it's, it's, it's innate, and it is, um, but the ability to trust, or knowing how to trust, or when to trust, who to trust, comes from the early development of core belief systems combined with cultural um, rules and norms. Yeah? But we, before age five, we already have beliefs around trusting or not trusting. And then those are, those are tested out in, in, in family and things like that family, cultural, and stuff. But plus, and, and there's been quite a lot written on this um, um, in, the, um, in the internet literature, not the social psychology literature, but also our ability or our willingness to trust comes from years of accumulation, of accumulated experiences of trusting and not trusting. And there's been stuff written, particularly around system trust, uh, around that. So, the, the interdependencies, okay, so we look at some of the contextual behaviors, the, the interdependencies that are rooted in our, our coexistence require certain levels of trust, and in fact, very high levels of trust, that we couldn't get through an entire day uh, without subconscious, subconsciously trusting a lot of people and a lot of things, right? And most of the things we're not even aware of, and we can't even see, are visible, right? Um, so, so the, the friendship-based trust, um, friendship and social currency are, are built upon trust. And again, this is all non-internet related stuff. And our, our biological programming makes us believe that when individuals are revealing personal information about themselves, that they're indicating trust. Right? I tell you something, and then you tell me something, I think we have a certain level of trust here. Um, so social currency, uh, you know, the emotional and um, uh, social support is one of the payoffs of trust. That's why we trust. I mean, one of the reasons why we trust. 
Now, when trust isn't operating blindly or spontaneously, it occurs through a, a process of slowly building up one step at a time. And that's often referred to as calculus-based trust. And then in, in, there's another process uh, whereby both parties have come to understand um, how the expectations of the other person and how to um, meet those expectations of the person and there, thereby establish a certain level of trust. And this is referred to often as identification-based um, um, trust. A as a social um, psychological con construct, there are three levels of trust. There's the relational, which is trust in another person, the generalizable or generalized, which is trusting people in general, and then there's abstract system trust, of which the internet is one. So that's particularly uh, uh, relevant for for us because um, trusting in the in the internet is not easy because so many of the technical processes that underlie the internet are transparent to the user. So that requires a certain level of trust. Okay, now, now this is the end of the the psychological, psychognitive bit. So are there any questions before we start looking at some of the changes that are occurring? Yes, I have one. Um, I like this abstract trust thingy. Um, however, the internet is some kind of medium, more or less. You, you have some people behind that, or at least interests, companies, legal persons. However, you can, um, let's see, it's an interpersonal communication, more or less. So. But I have the same feeling about cars. I mean, if you're driving on an autobahn in Germany, it's like, I don't know, 200 miles per hour or something, and the brakes will fail. Nobody thinks about it, of course. But you have a, um, a trust level reach, which is more or less beyond good and evil. Because you're driving that fast, and in, in this, your, I don't know, steering wheel, whatever fails, you have a problem. So why do people actually um, trust the car, which is even less transparent than the internet because you can look up all the RCs or whatever, while the car is covered by, um, I don't know, engineering stuff which is even protected by trade secrets and so on. Mm -hmm. So but with thousands of standards inside it. Exactly, yeah. And even the standards are not open, you have to pay a few thousand euros just to see the standards. Like ISO, I don't know. Is that part of your second presentation or is that? N no, no. I, I have talked about, inter so you're, is it a question or is it a comment? Yes. Why do people behave like that? Why do people trust machines, or why do people trust things that are less transparent? Exactly. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. The, the abstract, ab abstract system. Um, um, yeah. Trust. Why do people trust the internet when they can't see it? And like you said, there's so many other things going. It's not just the internet. The internet's just the plumbing, right? Mm -hmm. but you're, you're trusting it to get you from A to B, and nothing nasty happening in between. And do you trust other drivers? Uh, yeah. We have to. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There, there's quite a lot you written have in behaviors it. Behaviors that, that try to minimize the risk of other drivers doing things which are not in your uh, interest. The, also, trust is developmental, right? So the first time you drive a car, you might be more nervous than driving it later, right? So you might trust yourself and the car. Yeah, with, with, yeah. This is com well, complementary to what's actually systems. happening. The first time using the internet, you're uh, seeing it and you're, wow, hmm? it's cool, I will enter all my stuff, how are you doing? Yeah, so yeah let's break off. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Break off. And once you get used to it, you just uh, put less trust into it, which is far contrary to what's actually happening. Sorry, that goes back to something someone said um, yesterday. It might have been <coughs> one of the discussion groups about. Um, and I hope I'm not sharing anything that, that's going to be the, the, the big deal in the, this, in the presentations tomorrow, but um, the idea that uh, we don't see the consequences of sharing our privacy, right? That we don't yeah. see the consequences of sharing our information immediately. Like we, the computer doesn't zap us when we, when we say mm. too much. And, and it's kind of, is that, is that kind of what you're getting at? Yeah, but the same with the car. I mean, yeah. I, I, I don't not think about the consequences when I'm right. driving a car. Yeah, that's, yeah. The, we'll, 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 we'll be touching on that okay. in, in, the, in the next few slides. It's just touching on it. Um, Gaia, you had a question, right? Did you? Oh, I'm sorry, I thought I saw it. But you, you had a question. It's already taken care of. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Was there any? No, trust is absolutely key for the internet. 
I mean, partly because it's it's so trans so much of it is transparent to the user, uh, but but also because the internet is not secure. There's no security right now on the internet to speak of. To speak of, so you do have to trust it. There has to be a certain amount of trust. So there's quite a lot been written on this. Yes. Yeah, so. yeah. Can you tell a little bit more about the biological programming of trust? Because you said kids are very trusting, but kids don't trust universally. Kids trust the referent educator. So even like if the mom please do something, they would see, look at the mom, see if she worried, then I will worry. Otherwise, I don't. So they sort of tend to have a referent educator. Most of the times it's the mom, but it can be somebody else to whom they would, you know, refer all the time to see what would be the reaction. What's what trustworthy and what's not trustworthy. What's not. Yes. So then is it biological <coughs> program just for that kind of relation and not universal? So how, how do you go from this, you know, reference to be trusty with... Yeah, with I, I, I see it, I see it that, that it starts, okay, it's, it's, bi it's biologically programmed. So we're born with it, you know, it's, it's there, okay, it's there. And then I think that the, the next level is what I refer to is that then trust um, is, and then it's manifested it's in a different level. It comes from our core belief systems that are formulated very early on, okay. So if we have a core, if a core belief system is, is created, developed like first year, that um, I'm not safe here, I'm not safe therefore I can't trust, right? It's trust related. Okay, then that child is all going to be predisposed uh, towards not trusting. So that's one. Or if that hasn't become a core belief system and they have another one, well then trust is not going to be an issue for them. So it depends on what happens at, at the f initial five stages. But then, then, you're, then, then it's, as you say, then it becomes contextual, relational and contextual. So how it, how, how it, um, the information it's gathering from its environment and its experiences and the relational, um, the relational um, trust that it's experiencing, you know, from mother, father, teacher, yeah, the authority figures. Mm -hmm. so, so trust is an accumul accumulative um, building, building process. But it's argued um, that it's, it's innate, so you're born with it. You know, we're wired up that way. It helps? Oh. Okay. Okay, so this is really kind of bringing together um, what, we, what we've just talked about. And um, the, if we look at the, the four areas that we've just looked at, we could see that there's, there are four themes. Okay, the themes around the questions. Okay, so with identity, we saw the three questions. You know, who am I? Um, where am I? Where do I belong? With regards to identity construction, there is how do I create my how do I create my identity? Um, where do I create it, and, and with whom or by whom do I create it? With trust is why do I trust? What do I trust? And whom do I trust? Um, and with privacy, there's what what do I reveal? To whom do I reveal? And how do I reveal it? So these questions run through, um, so, so these three key questions for each area is one of the themes. The other theme is the, di the tension, the dynamic tension, that, that's the, the fear and the desire that runs through each one. The fear, desire uh, around identity, fear, desire, uh, construction, uh, identity construction, trust, and privacy. So that, that's also an important theme. And the, the other um, two themes relate to the um, the uh, freedom of choice and control, right? So in each of these questions, each of these levels and the questions, I think what it is, may I maybe wave my hand, huh? Yeah. No, I guess yesterday was a different boat. There was some kind of gray, arrow, gray shaped yeah. box on the left, but it's not there anymore, so. Don't trust it. <laughs> <laughs> well, I certainly don't trust this yeah. and that. So. Um, yeah, so it's around the freedom that there's, if we look at each level, the, the individual has the freedom of choice um, uh, around the, um, 
the outcome of the, of the question. It can choose who am I, or like for example, um, why do I trust? There's a freedom of choice. I am going to trust, I'm not going to trust. And I can control the outcome of, of, of uh, those decisions. So this is important. I think the question's attention and the choice and control in particular is important to keep in the back of the mind, uh, your mind, when we're looking at um, digital domains and digital experiences, because we'll, we'll see a, um, a decrease of the importance or even the, the prevalence of those, those two areas. Okay, this is a busy slide. The, um, I, you try to put a lot of information together simply. So if we consider these three axes of identity um, in relation to the influence of digital experiences, it's not surprising that we're beginning to see a shifting notion of identity. So for example, first with the organization of experience, we can see that the temporal, spatial boundlessness um, of, of the digital environment, that it, it leads to a feeling of invincibility and um, invisibility. So in, in the expansion of realms where uh, the, the identity exploration um, process takes place, the realms are expanding you know, incredibly um, dramatically and, and um, widely. So whereas before these boundaries, the, the boundaries were um, clearly defined, um, they were, and they were relatively containable. But now they're converging, so up here, now they're, now they're converging, collapsing. Perhaps some of them are becoming extinct or will become extinct. And there'll be formation of new ones you know, in, the, in, the, in the future. Um, so this has um, implications not just for how human beings are organizing their, their experiences, because remember this is universal and it's innate. So we were going to, we're going to do it either physically or we're going to be doing it on the internet, which is what's, ha what's happening now. So, but not only does it impact the way that individuals will be organizing their experiences and are, but it has implications for privacy and trust as well, for the dynamics of privacy and, and, and trust. Um, so with the, um, with the dynamic tension, what we're, as the, um, as, a di as the whole construction process is speeding up and expands into new realms and all that, the, the dynamic tension is increasing and becoming perhaps elastic. So what we see here is the desire becomes much more acute. It's all about more right now and anywhere but here. And then with the fear, it's, the, it's what we saw before, but it becomes much more accentuated and elastic. And uh, it's all around the diminishment and, and, and theft. You know, theft used being, um, you know, theft of identity, the theft of uh, information. So, so the construction process that we looked at before, it becomes a spiral one in which the continuous accelerating increasing and decreasing, um, increases and decreases in the generation of identity content um, becomes much wider and spiral and, and as it goes into, into um, new realms. So, I mean, there's a lot here, so, you know, this is just an overview, we're not going to go into any detail, but what, what the, the point of this is to show that these three changes, the changes that are occurring in these three areas, that it's pointing to shifting notions of identity. So, in the future, I think the, the, the question is, are there going to be, um, will identity take on a new dimension, um, as it's being created more and more? Um, on the internet, or will it have several new dimensions? I mean, we just don't know what's going to happen to the whole notion of, of identity. Uh, shifts in identity are important because it, because it forms the backdrop for uh, trust and privacy, but pretty much everything else too. So, you know, if, if our concept of who we are is undergoing dramatic change, well, that's got pretty far-ranging um, implications. 
how we're we doing for time. Oh, we're doing okay. Okay, now. Okay, here is a um, integral uh, perspective of um, identity, privacy, and, and trust. Okay, so what we what we have here, what, if I break it into the, the four quadrants, and the each quadrant marks the the major things that are happening, that are driving the major forces that are driving um, or influencing changes. Um, again, there'll be things that aren't on here. I've tried to pull out the, to try to highlight the, the, the major ones. Okay, so in the, um, in the upper left quadrant is the psychognitive um, domain, which we've just looked at. Everything we just looked at before about identity formation and dynamic tension, fear, and desire, that's, that's all in this sub uh, su uh, subjective psychognitive um, realm. With, this is the space of the subjective I, you know, which is an internal perspective. Um, so I won't go over this because we've already just talked about it, but at the core is the, the questioning, who am I, who I am, which kicks off, oops, oops, now that was my fault. <laughs> I accept responsibility for that. <laughs> So, which kicks off this whole identity um, uh, uh, construction process, right? In the upper right, uh, in the in the upper uh, right quadrant lies the objective behavioral phenomena. Okay, um, so these are observable external behaviors, which are manifestations of the outcome of the identity construction process that we've looked at here. Okay, uh, at the freedom is shown as at the core because um, digital experiences offer um, a, a different, um, different types of freedom that can trigger, that can trigger or um, lead to expansive identity behaviors, right? So we can see how the freedom leads to the power of choice. Okay, we're talking about um, external behaviors now um, on the internet, this is all internet stuff. So the power of choice, how am I going to create my identity here? I've got all these different realms I can explore, I can mask, I can disembody myself, I can re-erase my identity and reinvent it. Um, but the important thing is that the, these the expansive identity behaviors, um, they lead to new rules of identity construction. And, and that's something that, that, that's of interest. So how are, what are the new rules of the way we create our identity online? Um, because these these new um, these new rules will encompass a fluid identity and infinite possibilities. Right? So in the in the lower left quadrant here, we have the intersubjective cultural domain of trust. Okay, here lies the we, the we perspective, right? Which is internal and subjective, which really means the subjective process um, involves interrelationships, okay? So, and this is where trust lies. So we, we start with the, um, with the innate, which we've already talked about, the innate being at the core because it's part of our biological um, programming, which is reflected in our, the wiring up of our brains, um, which Schneier um, would say, uh, I don't know if you're familiar what he talks about, our brain wiring, have you? It's, it's on your reading list, it's good stuff. Uh, he talks about um, our brain wiring and that it's way out of date. It's way out of date and it doesn't function anymore. And so he talks about how that's just totally, uh, that's one of the reasons we have well, problems in society, but particularly like with, with the internet. So this, this brain wiring, okay, which is, let, let, let's accept his theory for the moment that it's faulty. It's faulty and it just doesn't work anymore which could be one of the reasons why we're seeing this dumbing down in, in, um, in trust and privacy behaviors on the internet. Are, are you familiar with the, the, the dumbing down literature? That there's, there's quite a lot. Okay. Yeah. Um, so like Nicholas Carr, is Google making us dumber? Yeah. 
So, yeah, there, there's a theory that we are seeing this dumbing down of, of behaviors um, on, on, on the Internet when it comes to trust and privacy. But it also, uh, it may come from faulty wiring, I mean, who knows, but it also comes from naivety, the sense of invincibility, the feeling of anonymity, the, you know, the feeling that you're totally anonymous, anonymous in this open, expansive black hole, right? And I think you touched on that a moment ago. Did you touch on that a moment ago? And, and the research indicates that in online, um, and this is a, a really interesting area about what, why this is happening, the research indicates that in online interactions that trust is not as necessary in building relationships as it is in face-to-face -face counters. So we, 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 will, we will create all kinds of new friends online whom we wouldn't that we wouldn't do offline without a certain level of trust. And, uh, and in, in fact, studies show that, um, that online relationships do, um, do develop in sites where the um, perceived safety, um, trust, and privacy um, safeguards are extremely low. Yeah. Um, an important thing that's emerging um, that, that's emerging from, from uh, research is that social currency is driving identity and trust on the internet. Uh, is, is that something you're exploring in your... Yeah? But we haven't really talked about... We kind of talked about social currency, but not really. Mm. So that, 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 that's an important theme. Um, and as more of our lives move into the digital realm, you know, what we read, what we, what we watch, what we buy online, uh, where we're tagged, where we're tagged and the 140 character um, thoughts that we, we share with the world, where con those all feed into the reconstruction of our identities online. And these fragmented um, bits and bytes, they, um, they collectively um, form who we, who we are and, and um, are used as a form of authentication on, on, on the web. So um, before, previously intangible things like, like trustworthy, like trustworthy and reliability can now be tracked and um, it can be measured and tracked. Um, so although that has implications for, for online privacy. So it means that, that internet users are becoming more accountable um, th than, than before um, and that there will, they are now and will need to um, behave according to certain rules. So, therefore, what's important about this is that social currency, um, online social currency, is a major force in um, towards the uh, leading towards uh, new trust, the development of new trust heuristics. So that's pretty important in that. Since we have quite a few computer scientists in the room, do you understand what we're talking about? I mean, I don't even say that. Is is a common term that's used social currency? Is this term making sense in relation to your field? And then also, we use the, I, I think that uh, co people who study uh, cognition, cognitive psychology and social psychology use the word heuristics a lot, but that's not a word that people outside the field necessarily understand in the same way. So I'm sorry, do you mind just describing that a little bit? Her heuristics. Yes, heuristics are basically a shortcut. It's a, short, it's a shortcut for working out how to do things. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's basically a new set of rules or, or a new set of um, yeah, shortcut rules to to trusting. I have a question. How would you value nonverbal communication versus trust? Because I would imagine that online you only have verbal communication, something you can put in words. And you said that online we are more inclined to trust the larger number of people. That's what the research indicates, yeah. So I would imagine that nonverbal communication would be building trust, being important in building trust towards others in real life environment? In real life? Yeah. Well, in, in real life, we, we, we use many cues. I mean, we, we have, we can draw from, we have many cues for trusting. You know, we, have the, we have the visual, we have the verbal, um, may have tactile, um, but um, online, no, you only have words. Mm -hmm. Although what's interesting is the, is what you can, um, what, what you can infer from the words and so often it's not the words that are used it's the the way they're put together 
uh, the speed with which they come back. You know, so there's there's developing a whole range of things around the words. I mean, you know, you, I don't know if you, I'm sure you, you've you've heard people say, um, oh, I got an email from so and so, and and they said, ah, they said this 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 and this right, and they they embellish it with this emotion and these conclusions about what was going on with that person when they, and when I ask, so did they actually say that? Or did they say that in their words? Did they, did they, did they write these words? No. So what did they write? And they give one sentence of what they wrote. So, well, how do you know that's what they, well, I just know that person, or I assume that's the way it was. So I think we're building in other, you know, we're, we're developing other cues for being able to interpret online um, information. The inflection of their online speech. Yeah. Is the, is the, it's not what they wrote, it's how they wrote it. Exactly, yeah. Also, technology drives some of those cues. Like, for example, if you're on Facebook, you can see someone, you know, they are typing, and then they stop typing. Yeah. They're typing again, you know, haven't actually said what they're going to say, but that gives you some sort of. Yeah. And, and also, um, I know that, that sometimes if somebody is, is communicating something that sounds, that could be interpreted as being a bit harsh, and they put a smiley face at the end, you know, they put a colon and a, uh, a colon and a, a parenthesis, you know, so that softens it, because you read it and you go, oh, oh, yeah, okay, they didn't really mean that, yeah, so. But we may interpret things differently from a person to person, so we may... Um, confuse what was written um, from the from our point of view. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And that that, that hap happens a lot. I think what what the, the the interesting question was, how can we if trust is something that we build up, we know how we do that face to face, in, you know, in um, face to face in life, life, you know, in life, life. Um, but but how. Like, what, what gives us our cues for building trust online? Well, I'm, and of course, we're always hearing stories about people who mistrusted um, on, on the internet. So, you know, that, that's interesting. But there's quite a lot of studies that have been done on, the, the, on this. I haven't even I haven't quoted them because there's so many of them, of how um, trust is not necessary. Well, it's not as necessary in building up relationships and friendships on the internet studies, because we're always told how, um, you know, it, children are always told how important it is not to trust people on the internet, and in fact not to trust any adult stranger, let alone on the internet. But then we don't hear so, with, the time when we hear about the, the danger of, of, of lack of trust is often when it comes to the digital divide and those who have chosen not to use the internet at all. And the, you know, and the, you do surveys and you say, why have you decided never to use the internet? And the answer is because we've listened to all the government health warnings about how horrible things are on the internet in the first place. But one of the things that strikes me maybe um, hasn't been investigated very much is the extent to which your basic level of literacy, I don't mean your digital literacy, but your literacy affects the extent to which you can build sufficient trust to use the internet properly. And given that in the UK the figure was something like 20% of the population is functionally illiterate, in other words, they use newspapers for the pictures, they, but their standard of literacy is very low. Um, and it's, uh, you know, the, the numbers are actually not that dissimilar in the United States. I can see Andrea's eyebrows raising, <laughs> even, from, even from in front of me with the fact. Um, and given that, uh, and that there is, you know, it's well established that those who don't use the internet have a much higher predilection towards being from uh, very poor socioeconomic groups, but also from very poor levels of basic education, including literacy. I wonder how much uh, there might be an explanation for the digital divide based on the fact that people's extremely low levels of literacy means that they can't project all of the things that we're projecting onto the written word in our communication with others on, online. We're assuming a very high level of, of uh, at least sympathetic literacy in, in, in the way in which we're translating other people's language. Mm, no, that's interesting, yeah. Oh, okay. I, I thought maybe there was a load of No. Uh, I'm, well, I'm just shooting one. I've not come up. I, th I thought you were leading somewhere else about the, uh, the, the, the link between literacy and trusting and, 
and privacy practices online. Well, it, it is, in fact. It's the flip side of that, right? Which is that if people don't have literacy skills, how can they possibly have any of those kinds of Well, I mean, what one of the studies, and I think I'm going to touch on it in a moment, is that the, there isn't a relationship between, you know, this dumbing down um, that, that we're seeing in behaviors on, on the internet around uh, privacy and trust, it's not related to literacy. No, not at all. And um, I've just done a study in South Africa with 150 uh, subjects looking at trust and privacy online and across different age groups and ethnic backgrounds and, and um, educational backgrounds and socioeconomic, everything. There's no relationship. And the literature that, that um, and, and the literature norm, um, that doesn't show that at all. I thought the interesting point was. Th so no relationship between basic literacy and trust, or advanced literacy doesn't lead to advanced trust? Yeah, it doesn't. I think it's worth clarifying that the dumbing down um, claims are, aren't, aren't universally accepted. So it's not, it's, it's not. Um, See, and trust behaviors are, um, are like, they're not even declining, they're just very, very weak. So when you're using this term, you mean specifically in relation to privacy and trust and not necessarily um, no. uh, understanding content and, and <coughs> Well, but there, there are other people. I, I think it's, it's quite, I mean, I first started hearing about it when I was in the, uh, went to different forums in the, in the U.S. I mean, Andrea, it's, it's something, uh, what's that term that you guys, it, it, it's a U.S. term, it's become a verb. Uh, I, I, what's, what's that term? I've been Googled, or I'm Googled down, or I'm Googled stupid, or I'm Googled, uh, do, do you know? Well, ego Googling exists, it's, which is sort of reconstruction of the self by <coughs> what your Google search results are. No, oh, right, right. Ego Google, ego Google. You could do it. But there is, there, is that, there is the concept that, that as oh, it's, it's more, I mean, it's in the literature that as people spend more and more of their, their time online, Googling and wicking and, and all of this stuff, that they, there, there is a dumbing down. But th that's not the term that's used. It's, um, you know, Google brain, or I can't remember what the term is now. I first heard it in the States. But, but that is in the literature, yeah. People's writing skills, their writing skills, their whole literacy skills are declining as a result. I mean, there's a whole body of literature out I, there. I think that's <coughs> contention, contended, though. I don't think that that's an accepted. That's it's not, it's yeah. not universally accepted. No, no. The, it's, the literacy it's, generally, literacy skills generally are. You're not, you're not claiming that literacy skills generally are decreasing because people are using the internet. I'm not claiming yeah, that. No. There are people who do. No, I know. I just wanted yeah. to clarify that yeah. that's not a foregone conclusion. It's a body of, uh, it's a, it's a body of research that, that supports that. Or a body of anecdotal claims. It's more, it's more opinion, op-ed type pieces rather than empirical research. Yeah, yeah, I think is what yeah, 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 that's important. <coughs> so the, the, the dumbing down is the, the um, that comes from the, um, the trust and privacy behaviors. And, and that comes from empirical research, yeah. Not the term, though. No, no, not the term. Okay, so where were we? Okay, so in the in the um, in the lower right quadrant, we have privacy in the external, social, systemic um, uh, domain. So this is the the wider the the, the wider picture of, of what's happening. So at the core, which we've already talked about, we have the basic need for privacy. Yeah, that's accepting, yeah, that, that it's, it's innate in us. Our, our desire for privacy is, is at our core. But it's, it's the, the, the strong push for disclosure that's um, on the internet, and I think Andrea mentioned it earlier. Um, the strong push for disclosure challenges both the inher this inherent need for privacy and also the individual's choice and control um, around privacy what to reveal, what not to reveal, and how to reveal it. So I, I, one could possibly even say that this disclosure push is undermining, undermining the individual's need for, for privacy and their, their freedom, freedom around that. Um, because the internet, use, you know, more, more and more often as we're using the internet, um, we're being forced to disclose personal information. If, for online services uh, in order to access them, and also for the increasing um, social nature of, of sites. 
Um, so these are carrying a, a privacy cost for, for users. In order to participate in this, they have to disclose personal information. Now, the, so the other, like get, these mark the, the major things that are, that are happening, or some of the major things. Uh, you're all familiar with the privacy paradox, the literature on the privacy par paradox. Um, th th this, is this is about, this is a par about the apparent discrepancy between what users say about their privacy concerns and their actual behavior. Okay. And, uh, and th there's quite a lot of research out there on this. There's quite a lot of, uh, there's quite a lot of evidence from research stud studies that indicate that, that although Internet users express privacy um, protectionist ideas and views, um, that rarely translates into their actual behavior. Um, and, and I certainly found that in the, in the study that I just carried out um, as well. Um, there's just a, there's a huge, huge gap. And I noticed you're just laughing. Was, he's familiar with this? Yeah. Yeah, we have some of hmm? Yeah, people, yeah, that has to do, I was working on some digital literacy people that over, usually overrate the skills that they have. You're yeah, right. So that might be with that. I was having a discussion with, uh, I think it was with Ian, Ian Brown, um, on, on this uh, about, because there's, there's quite a lot of literature on this, and I was like, well, I don't see why it's such a big, I mean, it's interesting, but I don't see why it's such a big deal, because it's part of our human nature is that we will say one thing, and then we go off and do something completely different. It doesn't matter. It's, it's not context-specific at all. all right. So. Um, I'm sorry that we've been interrupting you and, and no, no, that, that, I'm glad you're really useful, but I did want to say that we have to start walking over to Queens in about 10 minutes, so I just Oh, okay. To... I'm almost done. Okay. You're virtually done. Yeah. Okay. So uh, there's also a lot of uh, research that, that suggests that, that many users on the um, Internet users um, exhibit functional illiteracy when it comes to um, a privacy protecting um, um, technologies. Um, and it's, there's other research that suggests that in, that in digital social environments that, that users have, um, can have difficulty in imagining the kinds of harm that could come to them by revealing um, personal information online. Okay, so um, privacy train wreck is, is really the combination of the commercial organizations that are, um, that are um, actively aiming to erode privacy by making it um, make it very easy for users to neglect um, or ignore good privacy practices, uh, undermining them and even, or helping them to develop good privacy practices, you know, whatever those might be, you know, like changing passwords at a very, very basic, basic level. Um, and then we have, you know, we have the pri uh, privacy pirates like Google snooping software and, and Facebook and on and on and on, and the innumerable um, security breaches. So I think the, uh, the, the, the last interesting point is, are we, are we um, it, it's becoming increasingly difficult to live an anonymous life on, on the internet, you know, with all the social networking stuff and um, that, that rely on our, our true identity. Our online identity relies on our true identity in order to function. So what does that mean about um, remaining anonymous. The, the last important point about that, I think, are these, these visual facial searches um, are also part of this difficulty in remaining anonymous, um, particularly since web companies are now beginning to offer face recognition um, software into their tools and apps. Um, are, are any of you familiar with, um, uh, a, I pronounce this name, Akitis? A-C... A Keith's um, face recognition study at Carnegie Mellon. Yeah, he he, he ran the study because he wanted to see um, that he wanted to see whether it was possible to take information from um, data that was publicly available on the web, cheap cloud um, computing, data mining, and off the off the shelf face recognition, um, and run it on anyone either online or offline, you know, somebody walking across campus. And from that, um, infer and collect all that data, and from that, infer um, rather sensitive in information 
sensitive data uh, about that person just from you know one piece of piece of information you know their their face okay I think digital breadcrumbs we're all you know aware of that um, you know and, and, and what that means um, yeah I think there's a quote here you know um, by the, the, the was the we need to be sure to manage the personal information we publish going forward so that we can control what others see when looking back because you know the internet's been described as a world that never forgets anything yeah everything about us is collected there which has already been mentioned so should I I'll, I'll go through the last I'll just show you and then we can because we need to go yeah I was thinking we had to 115 but no oh, no it's uh, no, right okay so I mean you will have copies of the slides this is mainly um, just for each area that we looked at just bringing out some of the observations and some of the key questions uh, a key question and um, so I, I think the 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 interesting question here was that the the core of the human existential questioning and the search for identity and place in the world so far has remained intact everything else is changing and I think the interesting question is will that change too will, will that core change and how will it change I'll just the, the question there will a specific dimension of internet trust emerge I think that's an interesting question and the future of privacy you know is it um, is it as they say you know it's it's the end of privacy the end of forgetfulness and and who, what was his name says uh, oh Scott McNeely of Sun Microsystems you know that privacy is irretrievably lost and we should just get over our hang-ups over it and then other people have made those kind of quotes that you can just look at um, in your it looks complicated but it's simplified version and um, it's basically just taking everything that we've just talked about taking the, the psychognitive domain the internal and it's put it in the context of the external social systemic so that you can begin to see the interrelationships and interdependencies. Okay? And that's it. That was just, and the last one is just that we need to broaden our frameworks for understanding this because it's, we need to understand the, the whole ecosystem of the internet. Okay? Thank you. Do we have time for about two or three questions? Or were we asking all of our questions kind of during the presentation? We might have asked all of our questions during, and we might be hungry too. <laughs> so um, Carmen will be at lunch with us, as will Andrea, and so um, we can continue our, our discussions there if that's okay. Thank you. Yep, that's fine.